<laughs> all right. All right. So it was a very short preparation time, so bear with me if there's some quirks in the presentation. Um, so these are some of the things I've done for people who don't know me. Um, I started DevOps days with Chris here in Ghent and then continued promoting DevOps. Um, also did mobile delivery days, so if, if anybody wants to talk about continuous delivery with mobile stuff, happy to talk about it. I also did like the first puppet camp here in Belgium, so kind of related to the scene, I guess. And in my day job, I do things like this, like uh, this is kind of a, like a Periscope thing, but fully customized for a broadcaster. So this is kind of services that we try to do uh, for our customers. We take like the social things, but we turn them into enterprise things, and then they get fully customized. So basically that's what we do. Okay, we're a team of seven people where I work. Um, how do we do it? Like we have to do something from scratch every time, something new, something new. Um, you know, the way we do it, we don't run anything ourselves. It's only what we code ourselves. And for the rest, we use services. Services. You know, whether it's a CDN, Amazon, which are, you know, typically cloud, but when we have to rescale images, you use a service. When we do streaming, you use a service. Uh, database is a service. So we don't run anything ourselves. And it's, you know, not just commercial services, you know, CoreOS, NPM, just keeps on going services that we use. Um, also our support. So we don't run our own servers to monitor our servers. Uh, we just use a service very easily. And most of you already do this, like your own office services. You don't install your mail server anymore. You don't run your chat server. Obviously there's people who do it, but most of them are just using a service. Why is that? Because you try to focus on what brings the value and all the rest, you have other people worry about it and you focus on the core. It's one of the things on the lean startup where you focus on your own stuff and you try to get up and running with everything out there as fast as you can. And it makes it possible to compete because the services might be expensive, but think about the people managing it, they're way more expensive usually. And even on the front end, you know, whether you use Google Analytics or something, it, 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 it's everywhere. There is a theme, I guess, that's already clear. And it totally exploded when we used mobile. There's a mobile service for everything. There's hardly something you can install on site for mobile anymore. Everything's a service for that. Yes, that's me. Um, and I think the trend is not really, like the promoted trend is not like this. The promoted trend is uh, like this. You know, even we're a small startup, you might think we're an enterprise, but Netflix uses Amazon to render servers. You know, Snapchat uses Google to render servers. Uh, you know, Periscope uses an external company to run their real-time infrastructure to send out the hearts and the messages. So it's not just a small job uh, shop that's trying to use services to scale. Even the big companies are doing it because it makes more sense for them. And that's where most people hear about things like not running things yourself. Um, you know, the whole hype uh, and everything around serverless. I prefer the term service full because it's less, less serverless. Uh, and it's, it's a cl much clearer uh, connotation for me. Um, for those who has uh, played a little bit with serverless, show me your hands. Okay, a few? Okay. So every vendor, whether it's Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, Google, they now have like a serverless thing. Um, I think the correct term is for them is like function as a service. Um, and there's interesting things happening. Like there's a kind of a, a lot of these people who are starting to use serverless, they use Auth0, which is very specialized for anything with authentication. You might use Firebase because it integrates very well with the database and your um, front end um, uh, framework. And something like PubNet Blocks, who has heard of PubNet Blocks? Nobody? So, PubNub is a real-time messaging system, 
And uh, think about it as a chat system, you know, one message comes in and get broadcasted to everybody else. They're the first provider which allows you to just deploy a function that sits between the message coming in and going out. So it's almost like it's on the edge of the deployment. You can run your servers like a CDN, but you just run your code on the edge node that they provide. So pretty exciting stuff for me. Uh, other things that otherwise we'll have to do ourselves, but are now, now possible uh, and being expanded. Obviously, there's frameworks to deploy these things. Serverless, Zappa, um, and Apex. And what's interesting thing is they are kind of like config management a couple of years ago. They're reinventing the abstraction layers. They're reinventing a DSL to deploy serverless. They're reinventing you know, the database abstraction. Um, I want to do a shout out to the people from Ansible. Uh, Ryan is doing a good job uh, integrating Ansible with running serverless code. And uh, Apex, who is actually integrating it with Terraform. Because just deploying your function doesn't give you an application. Usually there's a database. Usually there's something else you need to deploy. And these are kind of getting to a hybrid function. And what's interesting for me to see is that people in the traditional form of config management that look at serverless like, yeah. But it, for me, this is actually where the, the next step in application management is going to be. So if you're just focusing on your servers and your load balancers and all that stuff, I think in the next couple of years, we will just move up the stack and have to integrate these part of uh, things. So I'm going to tell you now a little bit um, on the story, how we are dealing with having to deal with all the external services and not having to manage it ourselves. Everybody knows this problem. I don't know if John's here. You use GitHub because it's great, but when it's down, it's down. And it's, you know, recently GitLab or whatever. And it's annoying. Uh, the same when you use a CI system like Circle CI, which just up happened to update the base images where you run your system in, it's annoying. And you have to read all the change logs and all the stuff. Uh, that will changing in the next release. NPM, like there's little things. Uh, uh, we can't upload above 100 megabyte of package, which vendoring every dependency inside a package, which makes it more stable, is a hard thing to do if you have a very complex application. And we cannot ask them, we, we asked them actually, and they said, no, you should create smaller packages. So you're kind of like up to a point. Amazon, it's a great service, but you have to kind of call them ahead of time and say, well, we're going to have a peak. Please provide enough capacity for our load balancers because for in our case with the media streaming thing, <coughs> it's just going to be too slow. When people say on TV, let's go to the website, load balancer, auto scaling, it's too slow. <coughs> so you see a pattern emerging is that we kind of go faster with these services, but like we have to learn, you know, the old storage box limitations, we now have to learn all the limitations of these external services. So they go faster, but then again, you have to learn what, how it's actually working. Um, this one was funny, like we were blocked on Amazon with our email and we had to send an email uh, to another email address on Amazon to ask us to unblock our SES, which was a very strange procedure. But in essence, you can call and you have to wait. So it's really, you become dependent on all these things. So it's nice we don't have the ma maintenance of running all that setup, but there is a complete increase in risk when it's not available or something changes. So we worked so hard in vendoring packages and making sure nothing updates. And in the services world, everything's outside your control. Like, you might have a good documentation. They might tell you ahead of time. 
but if it fails or it doesn't fit your purposes, you're kind of screwed. Um, you know, running something on Facebook for a social thing, and then Facebook decides that they have a new policy, and all of a sudden all your videos are discarded because they think it's a copyright violation, that's really annoying. So that's the downside of being dependent on these services. But I guess what we try to do is to, to overcome this problem. And um, Mark Burgess's book, Promise Theory, kind of gave me some ideas on how to cope with these uh, problems. I know I'm going a bit of a tan tangent on from the original uh, title, but, but that's because I had this part of the slides. But basically what I'm saying is that uh, the whole ecosystem of config is not just, just your servers and just your load balancers. In the future, it's just going to explode to whatever external service that you start to be using. And the problem is going to be harder because you can't control them. So that's the basic point. So promise theory. What I say is that you know, when you're like an agent in the ecosystem, you make the promises to other parts in your system. So in a services economy, like, okay, a service makes a promise to me and I make a promise to my customers, and that's basically how it works. And my promises should be verifiable. So if somebody says, well, I guarantee X amount of requests per second, and so on, in the services world, how can I verify this? I don't know, I have to trust you. So it's, it's, it's kind of annoying. But you might say up on your website, you know, with how you do things. But the, the, the interesting part of promise theory that it's a promise, but I cannot take it for a given. So I have to assume failure. I have to assume that the promise might break. Uh, it's the same in resilient systems. I have to assume that one of the system components can go down and in an internal system, I might say, well, I can replace it. In an external service, what do you do? So the problem is just amplified on how to deal with these things. And the conditions should be part of your promise. Uh, let's say I'm hitting the load balancer, and Amazon says it's, you know, it will auto-scale, it will have enough capacity. It should explain what the condition is, how it auto-scales, because then I can know whether it can auto-scale fast enough or not. And now, most of the time, I have to see this by empirical tests and see what happens in real life. Uh, but it's something that we need to get better at uh, when doing services. Like I said, documentation is becoming increasingly important when you're actually talking across services. The same was true for servers and anything you install, but it's just gonna be way harder uh, to get that across a barrier when it's not documented. And so the language that you talk must be shared. So I can say, well, you know, um, I'm talking in uh, units of virtual CPUs. What does that even mean? I, I don't understand what that means if you say this is a virtual CPU number. Okay, but at least try to get the definition when you make these things up. And you need to mutually agree on this stuff. I'm gonna go a little bit quicker on this. So in my ecosystem using all these services, I will depend on other services. And they are trying to keep their promise. I cannot guarantee they will keep a promise, so it's not like uh, uh, it can be broken but I know I will depend on that. And they will depend on me. And of course, everything that people depend on me, I have to provide the documentation, I have to explain things how we do. But the one thing I cannot do is say, well, you know, I'm gonna be available 90, 99% if somebody else doesn't back me with this. So, I cannot make a promise that they will be up and therefore I will be up. So if I want to do that, I might have a problem in, in the system because they promise A and I will want to promise B. Um, 
So when you make a promise, you should have a choice. Let's say I have one supplier of a service, which is up X amount, then I will have to go to another supplier that has maybe a similar one, but if I use two suppliers, I will probably be able to guarantee the multiple that I want. It's not sure, it's a promise, so I can break it, so it's easy, but I need to have a choice. So think of it like a mirroring or a RAID 5 or whatever across services that you want to use. So we won going faster, but now we're going step back, getting slower because we re have to read, we have to be sure of the limitations, and then we have to decouple the system by making it redundant across services or be able to switch services. So we won, but I'm not sure it's gonna be cheaper, but it might be more reliable. So I'm not sure. So we want to re eliminate the single point of failures. That's what I'm saying. So if I use one provider as a service, basically whatever is behind that is now becoming a single point of failure. If that one fails, I don't know. And I don't need to know anything about the internals, but if it fails, it's a single point of failure. And it's my duty, I can only promise what I can do to make that redundant again. Otherwise, I'm just you know, promising something on behalf of the others that I cannot actually guarantee. So, the point I'm getting at is that the more abstractions we, uh, we put, it's just things we ignore. And we ignore them selectively because we let somebody else handle it and we give them the money to handle that. So, coming back to the title, so servers, at this present state in my company, I don't care about that much. Application, yes, on the thin layer of still the, uh, the business logic that we provide as a company, but config is everywhere. Like all my external services, I want to configure into a state, I want to change the state, whether it's the pusher, uh, secret key that I have to pass into the container, and so on. So in my opinion, configuration management will never go away. It might change form, like not having to you know, install packages and do something like this, but having to configure something, whether it's Google email, you still have to configure it. It might not be code, it might not be service, but it's always config. Right. We can obviously have the problem of too many layers of interaction. Like a service using a service using a service, but that's a different problem. It's a problem of having too many conversations or having too many partners that we have to talk to. So when our team started using microservices, it was all great for the team, but I couldn't fit it in my head anymore during deployment. <laughs> And once I let it go and say, well, you know, each service is just going to run and we're going to run its service, it's done. But when it was a monolith, I could say, well, these are the incoming settings, these are the outgoing settings, that's the config. But with microservices, I set them all at the time, but when they run together, it's, it's hard to get into my head how that's actually cooperating. I can follow it, but it, it just puts the burden on the ops person, in my opinion. So when we use a, a service like Amazon, it's basically a super agent. They've abstracted everything away from us, and we don't see that anymore. And this is basically the result of running services. It's my recrawl, but it worked. <laughs> so, like I said before, whenever you choose something, changing provider, changing service, we've noticed that very much with our mobile providers or mobile services, um, being able to swap in and swap out an extra service is becoming the next step for us. So we had continuous integration, continuous deployment, and now we're just doing continuous service 
refactoring architecting. Because that's the next thing. Because service A has a new feature, which is a competitive advantage if you use that. So we just want to switch services as fast as we can without having too much impact. Obviously, there's a cost at building the abstraction layer to be able to switch between the layers, but we found it important based on cost, based on functionality, to be able to switch those services much faster. And the other problem that you have is that um, services, you know, API v1, API v2, um, it's just different uh, views of the world. And when you're running with these services, uh, internally it might be still the same world. It probably is. But it makes it more complex. And the other part we found in using external services, if they are big, like in Amazon, they're slower to respond to market changes. So when you pick your service provider, you might want to find a good balance between you know, how small is the company and how fast can it still do. I have, you know, I've heard, and might be hearsay, but that the people from Spotify, they went with the Google Cloud Engine because they weren't ready yet and they were still open to discussion how things were done in their data centers. So it's a partner that hasn't grown didn't say no because, you know, didn't want to run it, but they have a partnership with their customer, making them actually do the changes that are valu valuable for the customer. So the bigger you grow, probably the more you will say no because it's harder to change anything once it's running at a certain scale. So even Amazon Lambda has limits. Like, uh, I just asked for uh, a number of containers that we needed for a big job, and um, so they, they just have to say, like, hey, um, give us a moment. In two days, we'll probably have enough capacity in the region of Europe. So, yeah, you'll have to live with that. Okay, I'm going to skip through that. So, okay. So we've talked about this services world, and one of the things that always annoyed me is that people said, you know, once you have a good AP, API between Dev and Ops or something abstracted behind an API and it's clearly documented, then we don't have to talk with these people anymore. And I said, like, is this the ultimate goal of DevOps that we actually build this API, abstract ourselves away, and say, well, you know, we're done with communication, and it's done. Okay. So that was my moment. So I've given that much thought the, the last year, and I think it's still DevOps, and I will try to explain how I see things changing. So talking to services, I see kind of a new set of emerging practices. And probably you've seen a lot of them, but you might not done it yourself because you're still focused internally to your company. And a lot of the service providers are focusing outside providing services to people outside their company. You know, who remembers when Amazon was out one of the first times? They learned the hard way that they needed the status support. I know it's mostly green and it never hardly changes to red because you know that's the way I do it. But the point is having a dashboard where somebody else can see that you're keeping your promise. It's a way of communication. It's as simple as that. Pusher exposes their own metrics internally with us. So I can have an insight on how their service is operating internally, even though I cannot change anything about it, but I get an insight. Remember, we crossed the bridge between Dev and Ops because we couldn't see, we couldn't know, and we had to share. Now I'm just going the next step, not inside a company, 
but with the services that are actually providing value or a service to me. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty strange where you can see things like Imagix, so, severe render errors it made you go like, what? I'm using a service and they're telling me that they have severe render errors? So, but the nice thing is they, they expose them, they trust me, and if I see something happening on my side, I can see if something is happening on their side. I can probably not fix it, I'll trust them to fix it, but at least I give it an, get an insight on what's happening. I think, well, at least I saw it the first time with Travis CI. It wasn't Slack before, but it was, was it Basecamp or something? You could actually get to an engineer on Slack or on chat and talk to them during an outage. So even though they're working on a different company, there was somebody actually talking to me and I could get to an engineer and I didn't have to create tickets and tickets and tickets to get any insight. So I found that like a very interesting way of collaborating across companies. Um, you know, getting the logs or something that are inside a provider, getting them out, it's a nice thing because now I can correlate the logs from Fastly into my own systems. So I see it happen a lot that people lock the logs in their own service and it's hard to get to. But, you know, again, facing outward, it's something as a service that you start, should uh, start providing so people can just use the logs in their systems and correlate it. Just documentation like this, um, getting an error code, what does it even mean? I'm not saying this is something new, but it's just an example of, you know, whether you share documentation internally or you share it externally, there is no difference in that perspective. Um, it's not because you run on Google email and you will never lose your email that you shouldn't back up Google email. So you're still responsible for some parts of using a service. So they might provide something to you, but in this case, they provide an API to get the data easily outside and to be able to restore it. Because, you know, Many of the services have a nice way of ingesting all the data, but getting it out, hard part, it's services. Even as simple as going on, uh, you know, Slack is very good at it on Twitter. You know, if there's an outage, try to, you know, explain things that are doing, say thank you for importing it. It's just, you know, it's a nice way of communication between boundaries of companies. And many have started doing this, post-mortems, give the inside of what failed inside. And for some of the providers, that helps me get an insight uh, how their infrastructure works. And I might use their services differently because I know there's some weak spots, there's some good parts, and at least they're sharing that with me. Uh, being proactive, I don't know if you, Ever had this, like Amazon saying that your host is running on degraded software, uh, uh, server hardware? And they say, well, it's probably going to fail. Please replace it. It's proactive. Change log. It's not different than internally, but this is giving insights. Uh, blog posts are one of the efficient ways of communicating things outside your company. Talking at conferences like this and making documentation easily to execute and stuff. So I'm not saying this is rocket science, but the most advanced services are taking all these things into account to start a kind of dialogue with you outside their company. Twitter, Netflix sharing their code, you know, talking to engineers, getting graphs, even having people determine your backlog and getting feedback on your backlog. It's a way of communicating. What do you think? What are the problems you mostly have? Not something new. So 
This is not a deep technical talk. There's different ways of tackling this problem. But my point is that external services are the next silo, whether it's in people, whether it's in config management, whether it's in any technology we use. And it's one of the problems we are facing a lot. So I hope this is kind of uh, getting solved. So it's collaboration, making promises, and be able to verify that, and keep your promise. So for me, to be honest, this is how I feel most config management tools see the world. Who agrees with me? Only a few? OK, we'll see. So um, I think for me, if you talk to people on config management, it's, about, it's still about like servers and load balancers and storage. I think we're just missing part of that. Uh, part of that will just be abstracted, and we'll have to move up the stack. Uh, so I personally think that Terraform and the way they're tackling the external resources and data resources uh, and the rate that they're just adding new kind of providers to their system uh, is a very interesting way to just add things uh, to that. So that's me. Thank you. Any questions? So the question was, uh, if you're working a lot with super agents, how do you tackle the fact that, they're, that you, uh, you're still able to you know, deal with the redundancy or be able to change? Is that kind of correct? Yep. Um, so to give you an example, uh, we run uh, our database as DynamoDB, which kind of is a nice abstraction. You don't have to hassle with, you know, the only thing you have to tune is like add some read capacity, write capacity. Uh, but we've built in an abstraction layer in our code, which is basically get, store, put, or something. And if we were to go to somewhere else, it'll be changing that layer. Um, we moved to Docker containers. And uh, although we're using ECS as our scheduling system, the fact that we have containers which are able to run you know, on another cloud, it's probably gonna go, not going to cost us a lot of effort to move that. I think the, the, the biggest problem is uh, where the data is and getting the data in and out into different structures. Uh, but let's say you can run a MySQL on an RDS and then still run a MySQL somewhere else if you want to. So that's kind of how we try to tackle that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. So it's, um, I usually compare it like um, securing your house. Um, it's a balance between the effort, like you say, that you, and the risk. Like, assuming that Amazon will fail when we have the service in three regions and so on, that's probably going to be okay. Yes. But other services? We might tackle it by saying, uh, let's, let's assume our push notifications are down, then we have email that we might still reach people, or we make sure there's a notice in the app saying there are no push notifications. So it, we, we, we don't need to be always redundant with all services. It might be acceptable for degraded services as well. So it's kind of finding that balance and how much effort you, you put in there. There's also, for example, uh, Alt Zero is a service to, for, to do authentication, but they, the alternative they have is they provide also an Amazon instance that they can manage and run for you. So you might use their service, 
externally, or you might say, well, start up these AMIs, EC2 instances, and it's your own local version of Auth0, but they manage that for you. So that's another way of a type of dealing with redundancy. It's the same supplier, but it's deployed in multiple ways. Other questions? Yes. So um, I don't know if this is the case or not. Maybe you can comment. So suppose you have all these different services and you start building abstractions. Will it create a situation where the vendors then try and differentiate a lot to show that they're better in some way, thus ruining your abstraction and just being a never-ending battle? I sort of am worried that it might be the case. Uh, I think, um, so the question is, uh, won't there start a, a battle between services to say, well, you know, I implement this API and it's better and they don't have it? Um, it's my opinion, but I could totally be wrong, um, that it's in their benefit to actually pair with a second provider that provides the same service. Because once you start using the services, there is a need to have a backup way. Well, so like, I guess what I'm thinking of is, let's say you have like uh, Google's VM thing and AWS, and if you have like a really good abstraction that was like truly agnostic to both of those, and maybe there's even two or three like digital oceans there and whatever, yeah. then you would have something I think that's good for the end user, which is you know just a race to the bottom of cost. But I think that's bad for them because they don't want that. They don't want it to be literally a race to the bottom of cost. They want it to be oh we have this better service and. So, I don't know, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is the, the, the thing that they might, in the beginning, not collaborate, but then again, they might collaborate because of a standard. And, and, but, you know, think about the OpenStack project and standards, so that was maybe not the best example, but there are other ways that actually do work in abstraction layers. Uh, like, I think the, uh, the S3 on Amazon, which kind of, uh, you know, multiple people are actually using the same API to abstract it. So, yeah, it's hard to say, I don't know the motives, and you might be in that situation. So I think it's very crucial to pick the right providers and to use the right architecture. So that's correct. Thank you. Okay, other questions or I don't have more time. Thank you very much. <laughs>